I should like to tell you that I have seen some of the experiments shown in this film actually carried out at the All-Russian Physiological Congress. As you can imagine, technique is everything. This is Liberty and Justice for All with Jack and Paul. On episode six of the podcast, we talked to Kirk Sorensen of Fly Energy. Kirk's a nuclear power expert, and on this episode, we go into a little bit more depth on the regulation of nuclear power and waste. Hope you enjoy. Welcome to the latest edition of Liberty and Justice for All with Jack and Paul. Today, I'd like to introduce our guest, Kirk Sorensen, who is the president and chief technologist at Fly Energy. Kirk, tell us a little bit about Fly Energy. Hi, Jack. Thanks. to I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, Flyb Energy is a nuclear company in Huntsville, Alabama, and we are working to develop molten salt reactors, which are uh, an advanced form of nuclear energy that ironically was developed right here in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s that can accomplish many, many, many desirable objectives, uh, beyond which we can do with today's nuclear reactors. Now, before we get into... Uh your technology. Let's take a step back a little bit and just talk nuclear. Like, why nuclear? Well, the reason you want to use nuclear is because it is a reliable, sustainable, safe energy source, and fundamentally, it is two million times more energy dense than our nearest energy source, which is chemical energy. And that comes right out of the structure of the atom itself. Right now, we use the energy of the electrons, and that's great. We've powered society off it. But when we can move to the energy of the nucleus, that is a two million to one advantage. And we have to take that step forward. We have to utilize that. Before we get too excited talking about nuclear energy, uh, I think it's an appropriate time to also introduce our colleague, Katie Tubb, who is our special guest today, who does nuclear energy, among other things, here at the Heritage Foundation. Welcome, Katie. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Okay, Jack, go ahead and continue being excited about nuclear energy. As I clearly am. <laughs> so, so, Kirk, we get that it's um, more energy-dense that it's clean, all that stuff. But is it economical? I mean, that's really one of the questions that's facing us today. Uh, yeah, it might be all those things you said, but can we afford it? Like, what's the deal economically? That's a great question, Jack. The, the economics of nuclear energy have honestly been debated since the very dawn of the nuclear age. And, and this is something that I think a lot of people don't appreciate. It. That it was a question, even in the 1950s and 1960s, whether or not the types of nuclear technology that had been developed, namely the submarine reactor technology, the pressurized water reactor technology, would that be economic? And it has been a real challenge over the last few decades, although it's really hard to say right now in today's energy environment because there are so many proverbial bricks on the scale favoring other forms of energy and, and disfavoring nuclear. Many of nuclear energy's attributes are going underappreciated, while other technologies are getting, quite frankly, a lot of unfair advantage. You know, you, you, you talked about large light water reactors and the, the submarine program and bricks on the scale. One of the things that I think is interesting in the history of nuclear energy, especially talking about the economics of it and where we are today, um, is the role that Admiral Rickover had in determining that, we, that, that we're going to have light water reactors for our submarines and the impact that had on the overall industry. And though um, clearly Rickover knew what he was doing, we're, we're speaking English in a free society today, I would argue, because of a lot of the decisions he made. We're also stuck in a large light water world because of some of the decisions he made. What are your thoughts on that? Like, wh how, how did those early decisions impact us today? And how do we sort of break out of that, that world? That's a fascinating story because I have a lot of respect for Admiral Rickover and his dedication and determination. I mean, here was a man who pulled together a team and literally hewed the, the technology from a rock. That said, though, Admiral Rickover, -Rock. -Rock. <laughs> Admiral Rickover did not invent pressurized light water reactor technology. It was actually done by a scientist named Dr. Alvin Weinberg at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Remember, Admiral Rickover had a mission, and his mission was to bring about a nuclear-powered submarine. And how long did that take him? 
he started working on it in 1945, but he really didn't get any traction until 1949 when the Soviets detonated their first nuclear bomb. And suddenly he had funding, he had support, yeah. and he was able, between 1949 and 1953, when his prototype reactor went critical for the first time. And let me just heap a little bit more praise on Rick over. It wasn't like he was pulling together existing capabilities. Right. He was literally bringing everything to bear for the first time on this. So it takes us today a decade and a half to build a reactor based on 1950s technology. Mr. Rick, Admiral Rickover built the whole shebang in a submarine that goes underwater in four years. In four this years. notion that we hear that it takes forever to build a reactor and that it's not because of the regulatory uh, structures or these other things is complete um, bunk. And let me disabuse another notion. There will be people listening to this who will say, oh, but it was a different regulatory environment back then. We could do anything we want. None of those statements are true. If anything, the Atomic Energy Commission was far more cautious and careful in the early 1950s because they had no sense of where nuclear technology could go. So you had gentlemen like uh, Edward Teller that were be very, very serious about nuclear safety. It was not a, a free-for-all culture by any stretch of the imagination. If anything, a careful examination of that era will show Rickover may have even been more constrained than we were today. Ed Teller, God bless his soul, another man that is allowing us to speak English in a free society, uh, the, 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 the gentleman who gave us the hydrogen bomb. So let me continue a little bit more with Rickover's story. So, uh, Weinberg made the case to Rickover that if you wanted to power a submarine, the best coolant to use was pressurized water. And that was not a popular idea at the time. He had to talk Rickover into it. But Rickover soon saw, hey, I'm going to have a machine that's underwater. I've got emergency coolant everywhere. And it was the right choice. Weinberg also knew that the pressurized water reactor was not going to be terribly fuel efficient. But he knew that that didn't really matter to Rickover. He was going to use highly enriched uranium as fuel, and high fuel efficiency wasn't a big deal. So they made the right choice. The PWR was the correct choice for the submarine reactor. But a few years later, the Atomic Energy Commission was asking, what should we do for our first on-the-land power-generating reactor? And the PWR was put forward. All of the laboratory heads of the Atomic Energy Commission opposed the decision, including Alvin Weinberg, the head of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. But the five commissioners of the Atomic Energy Commission overrode all of their decisions based on the simple fact that Rickover had done something marvelous. Their thought was, well, these lab guys, you know, they can talk and talk and talk forever. But this Rickover fella, he gets things done. Let's put him in charge. Now, Rickover took the job with happiness because he saw the opportunity to bring a reactor on land as an opportunity to develop a reactor suitable for an aircraft carrier. And so he was more than happy for his naval reactors team to build the shipping port atomic power station, the first civilian nuclear power reactor. But it should be noted that it was universally opposed in 1953 when it was proposed. And how does that decision impact us today? It impacts us very heavily because the technological development work that was done to bring shipping port into existence, it wasn't like he had the tech with Nautilus. He actually had to come up with oxide fuel. That was new. New cladding. That was new. Con uh, control strategy. All manner of technologies were brought about to bring shipping port into existence, and it came online in the fall of 1957. By the, point, by the time you got to the point where shipping port was running in 1957, there really had been a technological lock. In because now you had a number of nuclear powered ships, you had a nuclear powered reactor, you had a nuclear reactor on land, and you had, uh, most importantly, you had a supply chain that had been developed between uh, General Electric, Westinghouse, Babcock, and others that supported all this. And recall that our Atomic Energy Commission made all the decisions of what nuclear was going to be back then. So by the late 1950s, things were getting pretty locked in around light water reactor technology. And you mentioned Nautilus. Nautilus, for those who don't know, is the name of the first submarine. That's right. That was the first nuclear-powered submarine, and it went to sea in 1955 with a copy of the, of the reactor that Rickover had first developed in 1953 in Idaho. So we, we were talking a little bit, little bit earlier about um, the regulatory environment today and whether or not it is conducive to building a reactor in a reasonable amount of time, much less, uh, any reactor, much less a new type of reactor. Um, and you pushed back. You pushed back on that notion a little bit. You said back then they were had a cautious regulatory environment as well. I think I would argue though that while they may have had a cautious regulatory and uh, cautious regulator, the difference today is that 
the whole system is built around one technology. So I would argue that regulation is too onerous. Um, but in addition to that, and perhaps more important, is that the regulatory barrier to, or the market barrier for new technology to get into the marketplace presented by this regulatory structure that drives everything towards large light water reactors is one of the big problems that we have today. Well, I think we can all agree that in a, in a free society, nuclear regulation is something that does that it is a valid role of government. You and I have had that conversation before where there are certain things that really do fall in the government lane, and nuclear regulatory is one of those. Uh, I think, if I might extend on your statement a little bit here, there's an awful lot of uncertainty that's engendered into the equation of developing new nuclear by regulatory uncertainty. And now having interacted with the regulator to some degree, I can understand where they're coming from. Their job is to be able to tell the public this is safe. They need people like me to go to them with a design and explain to them in detail how it works so then they can make that assessment. They can't make a blanket assessment prior to me bringing to them a design or other developers like me. So there is a a natural give and take there that, that has to take place. And I think just about every country on Earth has accepted that nuclear technology is something that needs to be regulated by government. Even in places like Korea or the United Arab Emirates where you have a single utility, a single vendor, there is still a separate and independent regulatory board. So you mentioned that the government regulators have to be able to assure the public that nuclear energy, the production of nuclear energy, and the storage of nuclear waste is all safe. But most of the public, I don't think, has a holistic conception of, well, how to assess the safety of nuclear energy to begin with. Uh, I mean, I, I, I consider myself to be a fairly sophisticated person when it comes to public policy and and economics, at least. But I I don't know that I can make that assessment. I don't don't know that I have a a good way to approach whether or not uh, nuclear energy is safe or not safe. Um, What do you think the main reluctance of the public is? What do you think the main reluctance of the nuclear regulators are? And what do you think the um, the metrics or the things that the nuclear regulators should actually be focused on should be? That's a very good question, and it might take me a moment to try to, yeah. to, try to answer it. I may not even answer it exactly in that order. Yeah. But the way that the regulatory bodies predominantly examine the value, I should say, of nuclear is around the idea of, of radiation releases to the public. You know, the NRC doesn't worry a great deal whether or not your reactor is economic. Yeah. It doesn't really worry whether or not you're going to make money or anything else. It worries about are you going to release radioactive material into the environment that could affect the public? Are you susceptible to accident or release scenarios that could do that? And and that's a different proposition. That's That's something that that I don't think a lot of people understand. If you'll permit me, I, I have thought a great deal mm-hmm. on this issue of what does the public perceive as nuclear safety. And it is, a, it is an irony in that in many other fields, our five senses allow us to detect danger. We can detect whether or not a fire is happening. And so by the time you've heard about an oil spill or an oil explosion or a natural gas explosion, it's either killed you or you're fine. You know, there's not really a lot of uncertainty there. But our five senses don't tell us about ionizing radiation. They don't warn us when we're in the presence of something that could harm us. For all you know, I have a cobalt-60 source in my pocket right now that is irradiating you to death. I don't, of course. But that's the point is none of your five senses are going to tell you that. And so I think for a lot of people, it's easy to be afraid. It's easy to be scared of things that you don't have a sense of. I have this recurring nightmare. I'm driving with my eyes closed, and I just hate it. And I I think for a lot of people, that's sort of how they feel when they're told nuclear is safe. They think, well, how would I know? How would I sense with my own abilities whether or not I'm in an unsafe situation, whether or not my children are in an unsafe situation? I'm relying on the same people who may have every incentive not to tell me what's going on, to tell me that it's fine or it's safe. 
And as you know, we have very little education in nuclear matters in a general sense. I was well past a master's degree in a technical discipline, and I had still been taught almost nothing about the basic technology of nuclear and about the basic hazards of ionizing radiation. And as I learned, I realized, my goodness, these are the same principles we use to govern sun exposure. We talk about distance, exposure, and shielding. Well, we can't change the distance to the sun, but when you're helping your kids, you say, all right, you know, put your shirt on, put your sunscreen on. Uh, and don't stay out in the sun too long. Why? Because sun exposure is radiation exposure. When you get a sunburn, that's a radiation burn. And I thought one time, why is it we're so ready to teach our children the exact same principles of radiation protection and radiation management, but we never explain this to regular people in terms of how things are with regards to, to radionuclides. If you go lay out in the sun for 12 hours, it'll kill you. I mean, there's no uncertainty there at all. Nevertheless, all of us still go outside every day and manage to get by. We live in a world awash with radionuclides. We are, even as we speak here in this room, we are breathing in a poisonous nuclear gas called radon. And you will do it the same way outside, and you've done it every breath of your entire life. Do you know what? You're just fine. Mm -hmm. But it accounts for about half of your total radiation exposure. It didn't come from the nuclear industry. The nuclear industry has absolutely nothing to do with it whatsoever. It's been on this planet for billions of years, and it will be on this planet for billions of years. Nevertheless, it's something that, that some people get very scared of. You know, they, they, want, they want some certainty about that. They want somebody to say there's no radiation because we don't possess the abilities or the tools to assess radiation hazards. Have you seen the HBO miniseries on Chernobyl? I have not, but, but the fact that a, a series about an industrial disaster uh, 35 years ago could draw these kind of crowds only supports my thesis. I, I wonder why there's not an HBO miniseries about the Bhopal disaster in, in India in the 1980s, which killed a lot more people than Chernobyl did in, in really horrific ways. And it was not perpetuated by communists. No. <laughs> but, but, but a horrible, horrible disaster. Um, it's just funny. Why does nuclear engender this kind of fear? I have my my, my suspicions, and I think it's because our media's main job is to draw your attention and to hold it and then to market it to other people. And there's nothing that can hold your fear quite like nuclear. It can grab you and hold you, and then they can keep you there, keeping you scared for a long time, as we saw after the Fukushima disaster. Nobody talked about the 15,000 people dead from the tsunami. All they wanted to tell you about was, stay tuned, and we'll tell you if your family is in danger from radiation from Fukushima. I, yeah, and I think that you're right. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that our senses don't automatically pick it up. Uh, I mean, at the, at the same time, there's something. I, well, the 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 HBO miniseries is a, about something more than just the nuclear disaster. It's also also about how the government handled it, which is interesting, and I think has some uh, implications for some of the things that we talk about on this podcast. Um, and speaking about one of the things that we've recently talked about on this podcast, and that is uh, nuclear waste and how to dispose of nuclear waste. You had mentioned before we got going that there were some disagreements that you've had in the past between my co-host Jack Spencer and yourself on Yucca Mountain. Uh, I want to talk about that because the last time we spent a great deal of time talking about Yucca Mountain. And so the, so the podcast listeners have some background there. What are your thoughts on Yucca? Well, I remember the last time I was here at Heritage, and Jack said, "Don't talk about Yucca." So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to talk. I, I want to talk I, about Yucca. Has, has that has that uh, command been rescinded, Jack? <laughs> of course, Paul's the co-host, and he brought it up. So, uh, so knock yourself out. But I, I will just add. To, Jack to, can to, talk about Yucca too. Right. Except I'm not going to. I'm going to hand the microphone over to our our, our other guest today, Katie Tubb, to defend whatever position she uh, chooses. Oh, to I'm do. certainly not interested in getting on the wrong side of an issue with Katie. She's she's far too skilled for my, for my that meager is, talents. You know that's not true. But I actually, I, I do think, though, that nuclear waste and regulation are the two things that hold up any kind of innovation in the industry. And I completely agree with that um, statement. So I would love to hear what you think about Yucca Mountain, because I actually don't remember. Okay. Well, here's what I think. What we have today in, in what is somewhat erroneously called nuclear waste is several materials. Some of those materials are going to go away very quickly. These are the highly radioactive fission products. Those materials, we can wait out. We can wait for them to decay to stable, non-harmful forms of materials. 
Uh, there are some materials in there that have very, very long half-lives, billions of years, that pose no risk to us at all. And then there are some materials in there that are somewhat in between that, that pose a longer-term risk. But the marvelous thing about that last class of materials is they can produce energy in the right kind of nuclear reactors. So here's what I propose. I propose we divvy this material up into those three piles. We divvy it up into the pile that we weighed out, and we weighed it out, and we divvy it up into the pile that 95% of it is the part that poses no risk at all. Take that out and go return it to the earth from whence it came. It's no different than it was when you dug it out of the earth sometime in the last 70 years. And then the final part, should be committed into a nuclear reactor to be permanently destroyed and to produce energy. And none of those three components need a deep geologic repository like a Yucca Mountain. If we only had the technology to produce such a reactor to burn <laughs> or to, to, to permanently dispose of that material. Well, you've come to the right place, Jack, because molten salt reactor technology is capable of accomplishing that goal. In fact, some of our nuclear listeners who may, who may listen to this podcast may think, what strange substances are in a molten salt reactor? And for those who have a background in the nuclear industry, I would hasten to remind them that all of our nuclear fuel passed through a salt stage before it was loaded into our reactor. We take uranium out of the ground, we make it into a fluoride salt, we enrich it, and then we turn it back into a ceramic material. So there's nothing terribly strange about the notion of making uranium into salts. We do it all the time. What we propose to do is to return to that same technological idea, to return these nuclear materials back into salts, to undertake separations between the hazardous things, the not hazardous things, and the things that should be fuel, and then to ultimately make an intelligent disposition of each of those materials in a way that maximally benefits society. How does that sound, Katie? I was just taking some notes. <laughs> I I don't disagree with any of that as far as, you know, your three categories. I think the problem, though, is that we don't have incentive to do that. Um, I mean, look at how, how difficult it is for the DOE just to redefine waste at Hanford. Um, well, might I ask a question then? Yeah. Do you think that the way forward might be for the utilities to assume responsibility for the ultimate disposition of nuclear materials? Absolutely. Well, in that case, I agree. So I think we probably, well, I guess we didn't even really get back to Yucca Mountain, but um, I think we're on the same wavelength for the, the bigger picture of what nuclear waste management ought to look like, that the industry should be involved, and that's where you get innovative solutions, whether it's splitting things up into three categories or going forward and just dumping it all, you know, in a hole in Yucca Mountain, um, you know, there's innovation there, and we can have that conversation. And the problem is we don't have a system that allows for that. Yeah, and, and to some degree that comes about because of the industry. The industry was assured early on in the nuclear era, because they did not have a terribly good idea what to do with spent nuclear fuel, that if they paid a fee, the government would take it and, and they would dispose of it. That has not taken place to, to nearly the degree it should. Spent nuclear fuel still remains at each of these nuclear sites. The government has not fulfilled their obligation to pick it up, nor does it appear that that obligation is about to be fulfilled any time in the near future. In defense of Nevada's opposition to Yucca, I have heard a number of, of, of people that I've spoken to in Nevada that say, we understand the science. We know there's not really a threat there. But we're a state that depends largely on tourism, and we don't want to be a dump. And I think that's a safe statement to make about any state. No state wants to be perceived as a dump or a refuse pile. And I would go further and say this material isn't garbage. So long as we call it garbage, no one will want it. But if we show all the wonderful things that can be done with what we erroneously call nuclear waste right now, I believe many states will raise their hand and say, yes, I would like to have one of those reactors that consumes some of that material and makes energy, makes desalinated water, makes valuable medical radioisotopes. I'd like to have that. That would be useful. And I think that's most of the federalism issue, and I think the other piece of it is that Nevada doesn't want to um, – their, their chief uh, period of negotiation is right now when nothing has been built um, because they know once that happens, they're in a contract or in a situation with the DOE for the next 100, 200 years. So I think that's the other part of it is there's not an equal playing field um, where Nevada can negotiate with – say, people like you. <laughs> um, 
so to me, that's a governance issue rather than a um, waste issue that Nevada doesn't see any benefit to it because tourism or what have you, um, they're stuck dancing with a 900-pound gorilla in the Department of Energy, and no state's going to sign up for that from my perspective. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and there are other classes of, of you know, nuclear waste that have been treated differently. Like we take Class C waste, and we've allowed states to form compacts to make their own decisions about that. And by and large, they've handled it very well. We've never allowed spent nuclear fuel, though, to fall in that category. And maybe it's time to change that. Yeah, that's an important point. I think if you look at the nuclear industry writ large, it's all been under government control at some point. And most of it's been, to large degree, exposed to the private sector. And to the extent that it has been, it's been generally successful. The one area that hasn't is waste, high-level waste, and that's the one that's been the most dysfunctional of any piece of the nuclear industry. I totally, I totally agree. And I think the time is not far off when the nuclear industry is ready to stand up and say, what we're doing now doesn't work. I've had many private conversations with, with utilities and operators and not one of them has ever said to me, boy, I just can't wait for Yucca Mountain. They've all said, I'm looking forward to when we throw in the towel on this and we finally do the right thing, whatever we're going to do. I, I think industry is ready. And that probably wasn't the case 30 or 40 years ago, but I think it is the case now. I think industry is ready to stand up and take steps. I think that, the, I think that industry is, might be ready to throw in the towel on Yucca Mountain. What I am less confident of, and when I say industry, I mean the producers of nuclear waste, the utilities. Spent that, nuclear fuel. Spent nuclear fuel. Um, is that they want to actually take responsibility for managing it. Too often, I think that when they say we are looking to do something else, um, they're just looking for the next government thing, whether it's you know a, a quasi-government organization or... Whatever interim storage, you know all this junk, um, none of which will work because you don't. You're not shifting the underlying incentive structure that has given rise to the same the problem we have now. So you give politicians the 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 ability to say, "Look, we did something, we fixed it," and everyone sort of backs off for two decades. And two decades from now, the exact same problems that we're dealing with today will be dealt with then. And the only thing that will fix it, in my in my opinion, is. Uh, to do what you just said, which is to make the utilities, the waste producers, responsible for nuclear waste management. And absent that, we will be stuck in the same situation we're in now for as long as uh, there's that long-lived uh, spent nuclear fuel that you talked about is around. Um, and I don't know how to crack that nut. Well, I think I think I think it's easier than you think. I remember that for every megawatt hour of electric electricity that the industry has produced, they have they have contributed a dollar to this waste fund, and that fund now is at about Katie would know better than I would. I think it's about thirty Four, billion. I would say thirty eight billion. Thirty billion dollars, and it's a and it's accumulating interest. So. It's not outside the realm of possibility for the utilities or some subset of the utilities to return to the government and said, I would like my money returned with interest, and I will exit from this agreement, which is, seems to not be in any risk of being fulfilled anytime soon. And we will go and take care of this in a way that will cost us less and provide more benefits to both us and to society. Here's the problem you have with that problem. Let's say you're correct. And this is why we're lucky to have... Paul Winfrey sitting at the table. What happens, Paul, whenever the industry says, we'll take that $38 billion out of the government and go do nuclear waste? What happens to, to the, how does that, what does that look from a budget standpoint? You lose money. You, it, 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 it ends up scoring as a huge cost. And that, now you have a political problem. That's, so what, you need to come up with a system that distributes that $38 billion a little chunk over time, and I think what we have wrote, written about is you have to make a, um, a distinction between old waste, that which has gone into the nuclear waste fund, and then moving forward. Um, I think that might be a way that you, you start to get around this the, the budgeting problem um, and, and, uh, and transfer responsibility to the private sector. Well, for several years now, uh, since a court order was issued, and Katie would probably know when that court order was, it has not been required by the federal government for the industry to continue to pay that $1 per megawatt hour. They have, for 
a number of years now, they have not paid it because that court order ruled that the federal government was not fulfilling their end of the deal. That, so I wondered, is there a bill due? I mean, at some point, do they get sort of a lump sum for if, if Yucca goes forward, do they get a lump sum for the energy they've generated between now and then? Yeah, that would be 2014. And I think they're technically required to account for it and just not hand over the money. Okay, so, so. it's accumulating. It's an accumulating uh, obligation in terms of accounting. I believe so. Well, that's no fun. <laughs> well, we, we we think we know the answer to yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a huge problem, ultimately. That, that I mean, that really, that's at the end of the day, that's the problem. You have misaligned incentives. You have a, a, a system where industry needs to just bring it to the curb. Um, government's supposed to pick it up. They don't. And then they get sued by industry to make them whole for not fulfilling the legal obligation. And then making the whole system worse is that the money doesn't come out of anyone's budget. It comes out of the judgment fund. Um, and then you have politicians who, on their best day, for the most part, tend to be not the most courageous group of folks in the world. And they see nothing but political downside by making any sort of move on nuclear waste. And, God, it's just depressing to me. I've been doing this too long, Kirk. But luckily... <laughs> luckily too old for this sort of thing. <laughs> luckily, as we pointed out earlier, um, we have the right guy here. Because I think technologies like yours are ultimately the way out. Um, and we've been talking about the technology a little bit, and we've talked about economics a little bit. Um... But I want to get more into to, to some of those issues. Maybe what introduced us, I, I remember when we, um, when we met, I had given some speech about the virtues of free markets and how um, if we want nuclear ever to work, we need to take a free market approach, and, and that was the way forward. And you came up to me afterwards and said something like, hey, I like that. I don't, that's not what you hear very often. And then I thought, hey, I like this guy because he's one of the only people who didn't say you're an idiot, Spencer. And I know so, a lot of people that agree with you, Jack. <laughs> right. Well, they don't often come up to me afterwards and say such. And so it was sort of that mutual um, respect for the free market that I think sparked the friendship between us. Um, since that time, we've talked a lot about what role the government should play, and um, some people, a lot of people argue, well, nuclear reactors cost so much, the government needs to have a role, and it's not just in regulation, but in subsidizing and making sure that the American nuclear industry is the tough, you know, the best it can be. So uh, um, I think I know what your perspective is on that, but give me your perspective sort of on, do you need a government handout to get your technology going? What's your view on government subsidies and that sort of thing as it relates to nuclear in general, but also for your technology? Well, I, I would definitely say that my position on this topic has evolved, and, it, and it's evolved out of necessity. Um, I, I probably, in our earliest days of meeting, was, was much more of let us go tackle it. But what well, I this conversation's about to get interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and here's what changed it. I have now traveled to many different countries and spoken with many different groups of people and learned from experience that in other countries they view the United States as the pinnacle of nuclear technology. They view the United States as the rightful and expected leader in this topic. They view the policy of the United States government as essentially the baseline policy of the world. Now, there are exceptions, of course, to this, but I would say this is a pretty generally true statement. And when I saw that and began to understand that, I realized that regardless of what any individual company attempts to do in the United States, other countries will continue to view the position and the actions of the U.S. federal government as being the baseline. I'm very fond of uh, Brett Kugelmass's podcast, Titans of Nuclear, and he has a number of excellent guests on that show. And in a recent one, I, I believe it was Ambassador Laura Hallgate talked about how the decisions and the leadership that we show are, are basically followed throughout the world. And so there is a strong argument that if we are to have a role in in reducing the potential spread of nuclear weapons, if we are to have a role in the dissemination of nuclear technology, we must have a forward and assertive nuclear policy. I'll give you an excellent example. Right now in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they would like to install over 100 gigawatts of new nuclear reactors. Now, many Americans can say, why does Saudi Arabia need nuclear reactors? Well, 
they believe they need them because they are consuming more and more of their oil internally to take care of their population. This is their export. They export oil. They need to export oil, and if they continue to consume it internally at the rate of growth they're experiencing by the mid-2030s or so, they won't have any more oil to export. It will be being used entirely within the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So they have decided we need to be using nuclear energy to provide our indigenous needs. Thus, we will be able to export our oil to other countries and continue our, our society. Regardless of what we may think, this is what they think. So they have gone out to other countries and they'd say, we'd like to build nuclear reactors. The United States does not have an agreement with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's called the 123 Agreement. We have one with the United Arab Emirates. Within the confines of that agreement, we, um, we made sure, we told them that they could not enrich uranium, nor could they reprocess spent nuclear fuel. They agreed to this so that they could build four Korean reactors that are of U.S. design origin. The UAE is a relatively small country. That's four reactors, about four gigawatts. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is much larger. They want 100 gigawatts. If you get to that scale with today's nuclear technology, you pretty much have to have uranium enrichment, and you probably are going to be seriously looking at uh, the the reprocessing of spent nuclear fuel. So the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia basically said, we will not sign an agreement with the United States that has those kind of restrictions on it. And we, in turn, have essentially said, well, we are not going to go forward letting you have U.S. US origin technology if you won't sign this agreement. So, from my understanding, they are turning to Russia and China, to other countries for that technology, countries that don't have any compunction against giving them not only reactor technology, but also uranium enrichment technology and chemical processing technology. So you have to ask yourself, from kind of a real politics standpoint, what have you accomplished at the end of the day? Have you really stopped the spread of dangerous nuclear technologies to an unstable situation? Or have you simply gotten yourself into a more dangerous position by causing someone who would rather be working with you to be working with someone else? I'm specifically interested in this because the technologies we're trying to use would not require uranium enrichment, nor would they require plutonium reprocessing. So we would be able to solve this problem, I believe, for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia without going outside of the confines that the U.S. government would like to see. So that would be an example of how the U.S. government could take a leadership role in this technology and make it available to countries that they know are going to develop nuclear technology in a way that would minimize the risks potentially to the geopolitical community. This is exactly the reasoning that President Eisenhower utilized when he implemented his Atoms for Peace program in 1953. The world is going to get nuclear technology. We better be the ones they get it from. No, that's a great point. And I think what I, I, when I, what I was talking about was a different sort of government intervention. But this notion of the one two three agreement and America's role in the global commercial nuclear uh, industry, I think it's an important issue to, to take up. And I want to ha- hand it over to Katie Tubb, who's been doing a lot of our work um, in this area. So Katie, sort of what are your thoughts on that? I actually agree very much um, with what you just said that, you know, I think Jack is trying to pick the bone of <laughs> subsidies as far as um, taxpayer dollars. And I think that's a good conversation that we should probably come back to. But I agree that the role of the federal government in the international um, world that is the nuclear industry is to open up markets. And that has to be done, as you say, through 123s and Part 810s, um, you know, the regulatory scheme that uh, manages um, exports of technology and um, infrastructure. So I think you're absolutely right. You know, the role of government is to open up those markets taking care of you know, the non-proliferation piece of what 123s are about. Um, and, and also, if I could just interject, yeah. the notion that by having a leadership role, we can make sure that American values and Ameri- things that are important to America are respected and, and, and asserted abroad. You know, we worry about nuclear technology coming from other countries because we're worried that it will not be utilized under the values we have. We have an opportunity, potentially, I guess the word is the projection of soft power, hearts and minds. We have an opportunity to use nuclear technology as a way to bring more and more countries into our sphere of influence, to see themselves as closely allied and tied with America and the way America thinks and the things that America thinks are important. Well, and I actually think both, actually, the Trump and Obama administration administration did a good job, at least as far as the 
the one, two, three, um, angle of things, um, the Trump administration with Saudi, um, Arabia, and then even into, uh, Eastern Europe and reminding them that, Hey, America is open for business. <laughs> I think they need to get better at it and more aggressive at it for sure. Um, but even under the Obama administration defending, um, this idea, as you know, as you talked about, um, enrichment and reprocessing and allowing countries to at least contemplate the option rather than forswearing that right at the beginning. Um, that's a powerful negotiation tool. And I think both the Obama administration and Trump administration have defended, um, the ability to have that tool rather than just throw it out the window like many in Congress would prefer. Yeah. And if you're going to ask countries to forswear that option, then shouldn't America be putting forward a technological option for them that doesn't need that? I mean, if we're going to say, we don't want you to use today's technology, but oh, by the way, it needs these things, but by the way, don't use those. That's not really a tenable position to be in from the position of like a Saudi Arabia. You could say that about waste too, where the Russians yeah, are so willing to take the waste back, but well, America what, can't, what can't offer that. What if we go to them? I mean, we can't even offer enrichment right now. We no longer have domestic enrichment capability. We have enrichment plants in the U.S., but they're not owned by U.S. entities. That doesn't bother me too much, though. Well, it bothers other... I can tell you, having gone to other countries, it bothers them when you're promising to bring them fuel and you can't even figure out how to get fuel for your own reactors. Except, except we do get fuel for our own reactors. I don't know of any reactor that's gone unfueled we as a result. from Russia. We import some... For, well, for, we import less from Russia today than what we did during megatons to megawatts, where, we're, we, where we were getting half of our fuel Let me rephrase from that. Russia. We import the majority of the separative work done to produce our enriched uranium from Russia. We... I don't, do we? How much, what percentage do we import now? Very high percentage. I could I could get that. For Is it? You. Does that include the down blended? Are you including no, the down blended? The down blended program ended a That's number right. of years ago. This yeah. is just. What's how the Domenici uh, legislation kept Russia? Uh, the Russian quoted to twenty percent. No, most of the most of the enrichment that we import came from Russian origin. Okay. And that's that's a sobering thing. We don't have domestic enrichment. We do have domestic enrichment. Urenco doesn't. Urenco is not a U.S. company. It's, but they are enriching in the United they States. Are. They yeah. are. But that's not considered domestic. I'll give you a perfect example. Our Watts Bar II reactor in Tennessee, sure. we make tritium there for the weapons program. Right. Watts Bar cannot be fueled by uranium that's been enriched by Urenco, even if right. it was done in New Mexico. Right. Because we don't have domestic Allegedly. There's, there is legal controversy around that, but we don't need to get tied up on that. I think the bigger issue is that um, there has been no reactor that has gone unfissioned as a result of no uh, not no access to fuel. No, there no. has been no submarine that has gone unpropulsed as a result of These are great verbs, not having um, access to fuel. And though I am hesitant to... Um, talk about a nuclear weapon in the same conversation we're talking about commercial nuclear energy because two things could not be more different but I will just say that one adversary has not gone undeterred nor has a bomb gone unexploded as a result of us not having well, we, we made a uh, lot of highly energy. rich uranium and that's pretty well, and no, we have a ton and, of it and now let me, let me pull on that thread just a little bit because that's precisely what we're worried about with the Saudis if you have enrichment capability and, and you develop that for a domestic nuclear program Everyone knows that that can be repurposed for the production of material for a nuclear weapon. Right. And it's not a terribly difficult repurposing. So when you sit down with people who are really experts in, in uh, uh, nonproliferation, they'll tell you enrichment is the, single-handedly the most dangerous thing. It's much more dangerous than plutonium. Plutonium is, uh, it, you have to build reactors, you have to go through chemical processing. That's more challenging. Sure. To enrich uranium requires no reactors. It requires no... Uh, it has no special radiological emissions because everything you're doing is based on natural materials. Yeah. Highly enriched uranium is completely natural. Yeah. Not in that exact enrichment, but the, the two isotopes of uranium have been on this planet since before it formed. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, agree, I agree with all that, and those are, those are um, important things. I would say, though, that we probably should not be... Um, Engaging in commercial nuclear commerce with countries whom we fear are going to build nuclear weapons or divert their commercial 
nuclear programs into military nuclear ones, except for that if we are involved with them. And that That's is, a dangerous proposition you, to get into. And I want you to know I am in complete agreement with you on that. That is the real challenge because around the world, you know, no country is perfect, nor does any country think we're perfect either. Our geopolitical objectives don't align with everybody. But we still come back to this real politic moment of saying, how do we assert U.S. goals and objectives while bearing in mind that that there are technologies that we would just rather some, certain countries not have? Yeah, well, so, so I agree with that. But the question then is... Um, do we let's look at Saudi Arabia just as an example. Do we think as a matter of policy that we're okay with Saudi Arabia having commercial nuclear power? I would say as a matter of policy we are. I'm not terribly concerned that Saudi Arabia is going to divert that and that commercial technology into military technology. It's today's nuclear reactors. Remember the reactor itself is a small component of the overall fuel cycle. Right. So now the next stage of that is to ask how much of that nuclear fuel cycle would you like the kingdom of Saudi Arabia to have? Would you like them to be end-to-end, -end, or would you like them just to have the reactor part? I think that it's a question of what the actual nature of their nuclear industry is. I think if you have a reactor, you don't have a whole lot of justification for a enrichment uh, and that capability. Is the situation the United Arab Emirates is it? They have four reactors, and they've said we don't need the right. end, to end, and and that's perfect. We just have the reactor. Um, or Iran, for example, who has one reactor, and they need all of this enrichment capacity. Anyone who thinks that what they are developing is not toward a nuclear weapon is crazy. Um, so, if Saudi Arabia says they're going to build. Um, 100 megawatts of nuclear power. 100 gigawatts. Or 100 gig gigawatts of nuclear power. Which is about the size of our existing right. nuclear 100,000 100, megawatt reactors. Um, if they get to there, that's a perfectly reasonable industry to consider building uh, enrichment. Like, you, you can make a reasonable economic case, a business case, for having enrichment if you have 100 large reactors. Um, but... But that's a different proposition than having built one, two, or three reactors and starting to build enrichment. So that, so I think we get caught up into looking at these things as um, black and white. They're not always black and white. If if you are going to, if you're getting up to twenty, thirty reactors, you start being able to make a strong business case for enrichment. But what if we could offer them? a nuclear alternative that achieved their goal of 100 gigawatts of electrical generation without involving the need for uranium enrichment at all. Well, I think that that's very I think that if you can provide that at an affordable economical price including waste disposition, which I suspect you can, then that's an awfully interesting uh, road to go down. And I think Katie would then say what role should the U.S. government play in the development of that option? That's exactly where I wanted to go. <laughs> I'm very curious about you and your companies um, interfacing with the national labs, the DOE, um, and what you wish that system looked like. Well, we we are are the recipient of a of a, an award from the Department of Energy. It was a competitively selected award. Uh, we were notified last year that we'd been selected and, and it, that we went to contract earlier this year. And so we've begun working with one of the laboratories at the DOE, the Pacific Northwest National Lab, on one of the key steps in making our, our reactor technology a reality. Uh, it's a technology called fluorination, and it's, a, it's basically a, a modern implementation of a technology that's been used in the nuclear industry for a long time. It happened to use a very interesting wrinkle on the technology that had been developed at PNNL. And that was what brought us there, was their research onto this new fluorination technique. And we saw that and we said, hey, we think we could, you could use this new technique in this different way. And they said, wow, we hadn't thought of that. Let's go give it a try. So that's the kind of thing where I think there really is a great potential partnership between industry and federally funded laboratories. When you can point to things they've developed and you can see new ways to use it and, and they've put in shall we say, the, the challenge of, of developing the tech. Uh, I think that's a great basis for success. We've seen that with hydraulic fracturing. We've seen it with uh, many, many other technologies, semiconductor development, where somebody used the tech in a, in a way, maybe initially for a government purpose, but then later on industry was able to steer and, and, and guide that into a more uh, competitive and, and commercial development option. 
what you just described um, is at least not offensive to me. Um, you know, we've we've actually done a lot of work that sort of uh, that that sort of um, supports the basic structure of what you said right there, which is look the the, the national labs is they're going to do stuff. Where we really get off board is when there's a government program that tells a national lab we need to figure this thing out for commercial reasons or um, we need the national lab to figure this thing out to help this company or this technology out that this company is doing or this industry. What we think is more interesting and more um, and will work over the long term is a system where national labs are doing stuff. They are doing stuff to support a larger national effort, usually in the military space or, or something that the government needs that the market's not not providing, and that companies like yours can come in and say, hey, that's interesting. Let me, you, your, the company, fund more research in that area to help you get to what you need. Well, let's back up. Let's remember where the national labs came from. And perhaps, you know, to the listeners, I'll, I'd, I'd explain a few of these national laboratories. These came out of the Manhattan Project. Uh, the effort at Chicago became Argonne National Lab. Clinton Laboratories in Tennessee became Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Los Alamos Laboratory came about from uh, Robert Oppenheimer's work in the mountains there. Uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab came out of uh, the work at the University of California, Berkeley. So each of these labs was kind of born from the crucible of of both the Manhattan Project and later the Cold War. So they have, as their first purpose, it was to, to develop nuclear weapons. And indeed, that was the purpose of the Atomic Energy Commission for many, many years. We have the, the, the strange experience of, of having discovered nuclear fission at the same time we were fighting a horrible war. I'm convinced if we met 20 other civilizations in the galaxy that none of them would have undergone the same experience. They would have discovered fission at some other time than they were fighting a war, and it probably would have been developed completely differently, and I'm not even sure nuclear weapons would have been developed. Nevertheless, on this planet, this is how things went down. And to me, it is a, to somewhat of a tragedy that... that this marvelous discovery of nuclear fission in 1938 was 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 born in this awful crucible of war because I think it has prevented us from seeing the true potential. I think the discovery of nuclear fission was just as significant as the discovery of fire many, many hundreds of thousands of years ago. And I think our descendants will look back and go, that was a turning point in the human race. But these national laboratories were not set up by the government to develop nuclear energy per se. And in some cases, their, their budgets have been heavily, heavily influenced by the development of weaponry. We are now at a point in our government where we're not actively developing nuclear weapons, and we haven't been for a long time. Nevertheless, we are spending the overwhelming majority of the Department of Energy's budget on nuclear weapons support. I don't think most people know this, but... We are spending more in inflation-adjusted dollars today on nuclear weapons than we were during the Manhattan Project, which is a shocking statistic. And we're not even getting any new weapons for that money. We're not. We're, we're literally babysitting all the ones we've already built. So we end every podcast with two questions. And this is actually this is probably the hardest part for you of the podcast. Um, and the, the two questions are related. The first question is, what's the biggest public policy problem? It can be in your field. It can be in any field where the government has a role. And then what's the biggest problem where the government doesn't have a role? Well, I think that the issues we've talked around, nuclear nuclear waste, spent nuclear fuel, are, are probably one of the biggest, if not the biggest issue that I would like to see uh, some change take place and, and that the government most definitely does have a role in. Uh, I would like to see the industry, specifically utilities, I would like to see them go and talk to the federal government and have a very grown-up conversation about what is going to happen with spent fuel. Are we going to proceed with a repository and just tell us if we're not? If we're not, please refund the money and let us go make steps to take care of this within the regulatory guidelines of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who, of course, will be overseeing all of this as they do. But I would like to see that that uh, responsible moment take place. And I, I believe that the industry is ready for that. 
As far as things that I would not like to see the government do, well, we could have a very long podcast. You only have to pick one. Uh, we, we could, have a, very, pick one we could have a very long podcast about that. But let me, let me kind of cast it more generally. I believe that a lot of things that we look at right now as great successes in our economy, the development of electronics and communications and computers and so forth, ironically came about because they emerged from spaces that were not thought of as to be important enough to merit government intervention. You know, the government was not sitting next to Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in 1975 saying, you can have 128K in that computer, but not 32K. You know, these guys were free to experiment. They were free to make mistakes. They were free to, to try things out and see how the, the market responded, and things changed fast. Now, can we do that in, in nuclear? Probably not, where, where it, you don't get to go play around with this in your garage. You know, nevertheless, I would like to see our government within, within reason uh, – not trying to assert the answer to anybody, but trying to, and this is happening. I'm not saying this isn't happening. This is definitely happening. I'd like to see it happen even more, though, to where they're saying, we're here to help industry make their arguments for why they need to do certain things, and, and, and we'll take a look at that. But we're really here to help rather than for us to say what it is we're going to do and what it is we're not going to do. Kirk Sorensen of Flybe Energy, thank you so much. That was a great conversation. I hope you found it uh, enjoyable. I enjoyed it tremendously, Jack. Thank you. And I need to thank Katie Tubb for joining us as well, our very own from, uh, from the Heritage Foundation. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thanks so much again to both of you for coming in today. Thanks for tuning in to Liberty and Justice for All with Jack and Paul. Please be sure to rate us on iTunes or Stitcher so that others can find us and look for a new episode every couple of weeks.